In this video, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the main time domain analysis method that's applied in cognitive electrophysiology, and that is called the Event Related Potential, or ERP. The ERP is a commonly used analysis method in the literature, but I'm not really going to talk about it in this course except for this one lecture right here. And that's for a couple of reasons. It's partly because Mathematically, the analysis of an event-related potential is really simple. I will explain the entire analysis procedure in one slide. Now, that said, the interpretation of ERPs can be a little bit trickier, and uh, I'm not really going to talk about that a whole lot. That's because I want to focus this course more on spectral analysis, time frequency analysis, and connectivity analyses for reasons that I will explain in the next slide. And it's also partly because there is already a wealth of useful information out there. There are resources out there in books and websites and on YouTube videos where you can learn a lot about the ERP methodology and the limitations and the uh, interpretations and so on. So I'm not really going to touch upon it a whole lot in this course. That said, I would like to dispel a common myth that I have heard before that I, me personally, am an ERP hater, that I am opposed to ERPs. That is totally not the case. But in this slide, I would like to express my personal subjective opinion about where ERPs sit in the context of EEG information. So imagine that this sphere represents the total, well, it's a circle, but I, I guess, okay, we'll just call it a circle. It doesn't actually matter the dimensionality. So imagine that this circle here represents the total amount of information that is present in EEG. Now, obviously, some of this is noise. Some of this is going to be non-brain origins like muscle and uh, heartbeat artifacts and things like that. But let's just say that nearly all of this circle contains interesting information about the brain that is present in EEG, that EEG can measure. So in my opinion, the ERP reflects some or captures some of this information, but it's a relatively small piece of the information. So I think a real ERP hater, you know, if someone who really doesn't like ERPs, they would just put this ball, this circle totally outside of the EEG realm. So I put it in here. I think ERPs can be very interesting and insightful. Uh, they're definitely very useful for uh, qualitative data inspection and cleaning and so on. But my opinion, my subjective personal opinion, is that time frequency analyses allow you to uh, quantify much more information in the EEG signal compared to what you can get just from the ERP, the time domain averaging method. And some of that information is also redundant. So if you're doing time frequency analyses, that kind of negates the, the necessity of doing or the usefulness of doing ERP analyses, at least to some extent. And then you will also learn in this course that this time frequency analysis method is actually a general framework that also allows you to extract even more information from the EEG signal, like static spectral information that's going to be the main topic of the next section of the course, connectivity, brain connectivity that I will cover in uh, the fourth major section of this course, but it's interesting that you can see, so obviously this is still my own opinion, but in my opinion, we still haven't really tapped the potential of EEG to tell us interesting features about brain function and brain dynamics. I think in the future, so there's already many other analysis methods that are not listed here. And I hope in the future we will continue to develop new methods to extract even more information out of the EEG signals. Maybe this will come from uh, machine learning or deep learning techniques. Maybe it will come from other analysis methods that we haven't really yet thought of. Okay, so with that out of the way, I would now like to talk a little bit more about ERPs, what they are, and how to create them. So what you're looking at here on the left in this panel are 12 individual trials, 12 snippets of data, all coming from the same electrode taken from different trials of the experiment. So this is one trial. This happens to be trial number 68. 
This happens to be trial number 74. The exact number doesn't matter. So these are 12 individual trials. You can see that uh, it's not really, there's not really obviously consistent patterns uh, appearing, you know, visually to, to the naked eye across these 12 different trials. And here in this panel, what you're looking at is 99 trials. So there was 99 trials in this data set. And the gray lines show every trial, so all 99 trials overlaid on top of each other. So it looks like a lot of, uh, well, it's just a lot of gray. And what you see in this black line here is the event-related potential. So how do you create the event-related potential from all these single trials? Well, it's pretty straightforward. All you do is average the voltage levels at each time point over all the trials. So this one single time point in the ERP here comes from summing up all of the voltage values for all the trials at this time point and then dividing that sum by the number of trials, in this case, 99. Okay, so that is how you compute an ERP. What you see here on this plot is exactly the same uh, black line as here. It's just zoomed in to the y-axis a bit. So what do you notice about the relationship between the event-related potential and the single trial voltage fluctuations? What you've probably noticed is that it's quite a bit smaller. It's around an order of magnitude smaller. The ERP tends to be around an order of magnitude smaller than the single trial variability. That's not by some mathematical uh, necessity. That's just empirically that tends to be the relationship. So why is that the case? Why is there an order of magnitude more variability at the single trial level compared to the trial average level? Well, there are two reasons. And uh, well, if you would like to pause the video and think about it a little bit, then I encourage that. But the two reasons are one, that part of this variability is noise. And so that's why it's useful to uh, average across trials. And part of the reason is that there is variability in the single trial data that is lost in the ERP averaging. So there is meaningful information in the single trials in these deflections here that are not present when looking at the event-related potential like this. And that is because of a distinction between phase-locked and non-phase-locked activity, which I'm going to talk about more in a few moments. But first I would like to point out that the ERP contains a lot of these uh, uh, voltage deflections. So it's kind of going along, it seems to be relatively flat, and then you'll get these really rapid, almost spikes. You know, in this case, it's coming, uh, down, it's actually positive is down by old school convention. So you get these really uh, large spikes, these big deflections. Sometimes they're really brief, sometimes they're longer, uh, sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're negative, and so on. So these are the deflections, the uh, components in the ERP that the researchers are often interested in. And why are they interested in these deflections here, these peaks here? Well, there's a long history about where this comes from, and here's an interesting paper in uh, the journal a History of Psychology that talks about the origin of uh, event-related potentials and interpreting event-related potentials. But the short version of the story is that it essentially comes from the history of uh, psychology and cognitive psychology, where people had developed these uh, kind of you know modular process models of what happens in the brain. So you have an input stimulus and an output behavior. And in the middle, there's all these different things happening in the brain. And the idea the theory, which was you know developed in the 1950s and so on, is that there are these different modules that take place in different points of time. So you might have a module in the brain that's doing some low level sensory decoding that gets sent to uh, or that information gets sent to some higher level visual decoding. And then you have some cognitive decision-making process, some motor preparation, motor execution, and then you get the behavioral output. So then the idea is that these different deflections of the event-related potential are reflecting the activation of these different kind of cognitive modules, perceptual, linguistic, motor modules. The ERP method is also a very old technique in uh, neuroscience because it is so computationally simple to compute. 
And nowadays, that's not a limitation. Your phone can compute an ERP basically as fast as a supercomputer could. But back in the uh, 50s through the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, computing power was really, really limited. And in fact, all the way back in the mid 20th century, people were even computing ERPs before there were digital computers. And so that led to some really interesting inventions of ERP machines. So here you see uh, a machine for computing an ERP, even though their digital computers didn't exist at the time. And this machine was engineered in the late 1940s. This paper was published in 1954. It's really interesting to read how this works. It's quite a creative engineering solution. And I encourage you to pause the video and read through this text here, which is the figure legend that's associated with this figure. Okay, so what I'd like to discuss now is one of the reasons why information is lost in simple time domain ERP averaging. And we can uh, illustrate that through a couple of simulations. We can see this in empirical data. And later on in the course, you will also see this kind of information loss uh, in empirical data, in real data. But now I'm going to show you in simulations because that helps drive the point home uh, more clearly and a lot faster. So what you're looking at here on the left column is individual trials of data. And again, this is all simulated data. So I made up these data. And here you see the event-related potential averaged from trial one to the current trial. So this ERP here, this waveform here, shows the average of the first three trials. This shows the average of the first four, and this shows the average of all six. Now, when you look at these single trials, I hope you can see that there is something different. There's something special that's happening in this time range here between around zero and 400 milliseconds. So your visual system is easily able to identify that there is something different happening in this window here. However, when you look at the ERP, even after only six trials, that completely disappears and you get a flat line. So if you were making interpretations about the brain based on this ERP, you would say, well, you know, this part of the brain is doing absolutely nothing. Maybe, you know, the, 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 the person isn't even alive. You know, this looks like just a tiny bit of uh, measurement error here. But if you go back and you look at the single trials, you would say, well, there is definitely stuff happening both before and after the trial, and there's definitely something special happening in this time window here. So why does this information get lost in the ERP? Well, it gets lost because this is called non-phase locked dynamics. And you can see that uh, these deflections have a slightly different timing. So the overall timing of the energy in this part of the signal is similar across the different trials, but the exact timing is different. So for example, you see immediately after time zero, this deflection on trial six goes negative, it's going down. And here on, on this trial and this trial, it's going up. So all of these positive deflections cancel out with these negative deflections, and that gives us a flat line here. So it turns out that what's happening in these data is that there is energy in a narrow frequency band and it's phase randomized, it's non-phase locked. So if you would apply a time frequency analysis, you would get a plot that looks like this. And then you see this is actually the average, just like this is the average, except this is averaging in the time domain, this is averaging in the time frequency domain. And here we lose all of the information after only six trials. Here we lose absolutely nothing. We retain the information from every individual trial. And of course, we see it in the trial average. And obviously, throughout the course, you will learn more about this phase locked versus non phase locked dynamics, and of course, how to uh, extract this kind of information from this kind of signal. Here you see another illustration of this. When you look at this single trial data, this looks like pure noise. And here's just another randomly selected trial, which also looks like pure noise. Here you see the average of 100 trials, so the event-related potential. Again, it's just a purely flat line plus some noise or like high-frequency variability. 
But when you look at a time frequency representation, you can actually see that there is meaningful information. There's structure embedded in this signal that is invisible to event-related potential averaging, but is easily recoverable by applying uh, time frequency analyses. Now, if you're not totally comfortable with interpreting a time frequency plot that looks like this, then don't worry. That's partly why you are in this course. You are going to learn all about interpreting these kinds of plots. Essentially, this is time on the x-axis. It's the same time as on these other three axes. And the y-axis here is actually frequency. So this is showing slow fluctuations in the signal, and up here is faster fluctuations in the signal. So that's a different y-axis. And then the color here, the color intensity, shows the energy at that in the signal at that frequency at that uh, location in time. So all of this signal is non-phase locked. It does not survive the ERP averaging. In the next video, I'm going to continue the discussion of phase locked and non-phase locked activity and explain when you can measure phase locked versus non-phase locked activity using time frequency analyses and ERPs.